Hello. So I just uh, flew in very recently and um, was a little bit late. Glad to see you guys. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, uh, kind of this weird uh, framework acronym that I made up uh, in order to help explain to uh, CEOs, founders, board members, and team members how to do growth holistically, right, in a very simple fashion. Um, I don't want uh, anyone to kind of underestimate the importance of being able to communicate uh, how to do growth and how to approach growth philosophically and getting everyone aligned, but we're going to get into some very specific tactics very shortly as well. Um, my background is that um, I've been doing growth for over 20 years. Um, at various points, it was called marketing, product, growth hacking, but it's just growth ultimately. Um, I'm currently the VP of Growth and Marketing at Bridget, um, and uh, previously I was the CMO of uh, Soothe uh, and the VP of Growth and uh, Marketing at uh, Postmates. Um, VP of, gro of Growth, actually, at Postmates. Um, so, let's just jump in really quick. Um, this is going to be really simple for all of you. This is really basic, but it's actually a good reminder. So, I'm not going to do the Shatner, but I normally, this comes in as an animation, I go, a process of, you know, like if you've ever seen Shatner. Um, so you kind of like have to like, you know, uh, you do, do the whole thing, but I'm not going to do it. And then you have growth. Um, but the thing I want you guys to really focus on is that growth is really dependent very significantly on research and prioritization and speed. Okay. Um, that is something that most people forget. That is something that boards, founders, heads of product, even heads of growth and marketing forget because they focus, a lot of us are so in the weeds, we focus on the channels, you know, are we testing more channels or we focus on the tactics? How many new things are we doing this quarter? What's in our Q3 plan, right? Um, but the fact is that over and over and over again in my career, um, we've, you know, I've been able to get lucky uh, in uh, outperforming either competitors that started earlier and did the exact same thing or were funded 5x, 10x more, right? And the reason is because of this growth framework, right? It's not because I'm particularly uh, better or smarter than anybody else in this room or out in this conference. Um, so, um, the re I'm going to just give this a, a couple of examples. This is not humble bragging. This is just to give you guys a sense. So in the food delivery space, right, it's a three-sided marketplace. Um, you know, you had, uh, this is back in uh, 2018, 2019, uh, all the way up till, till recently. You know, you had uh, Grubhub, which was public. You had DoorDash, you know, funded massively, massively, uh, even for that space. Um, you had Uber Eats, which had a massive advantage when it came to drivers, obviously, right? And then you had Postmates, okay? And you can also talk about Caviar, which was like the smaller competitor and got acquired. Um, and so you can see that back in like 20, 2018, in August 2018, uh, the, little, the little yellow line up here is Uber Eats. You know, the blue line uh, is DoorDash. The green is Grubhub. And Postmates is way down below in fourth place. But you'll notice something happened starting in uh, late uh, in uh, late 2018 uh, and 2019, and that is uh, uh, Postmates started to take off in terms of its share of downloads to where it was actually tied for second place. Now, how does that happen? All right, so we'll get to that, um, and then ultimately. And the, the period of time I was there was like from the bottom of this, this little spot here up until, you know, past there, okay? That, that's, that's when we kind of applied the ROAR framework, right? Um, so how do you go from being in fourth place, right, behind three better funded competitors and better resourced, right, and having structural advantages like Uber had um, to acquiring 537,000 first food orders in one single month. How do you do that? Okay. Um, and then that's a large company, right? That's a large company example. So let's shift it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Before I go to that. Um, so, and then, you know, of course, being able to do something like that. So we went from downloads to first food orders to valuation and funding, right? These things are all intricately tied. So during my time there, and again, this isn't about me, it's about the framework, right? It's applying the framework. Um, our valuation went from 1.2 billion to 1.85 billion, 
you know, just five months later, right? And that's, again, on the strength of that growth. So, and then let's shift. Let's go to a much smaller company, a company that was making, you know, I mean, I met them, Merlin, the founder of Soothe, when it was like him and Brad and like a dog and a couple people. And then they added Chris Toe, the CTO. So it was like really, and then so I was just like an advisor and, and, and helping out a little bit. Um, and then after they got their Series A, I joined, and then they grew uh, they grew their monthly revenue a thousand percent, right? Over twelve months or so, well, thirteen months technically. Um, and every single month was twenty to thirty percent month over month revenue growth during that time. Every single month, except June. June was under twenty percent. June, for whatever reason, June sucked. Okay. And I think there's a the, the head of marketing for Soothe now is here. So this is like earlier. This is like from 2015 to 2016. So if he he is here, I love you, brother. Uh, but uh, 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 but uh, 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 this is much much earlier, right? So this was when Soothe was like went from zero to like you know 30k a month, and then from and this piece is from uh, 30k a month to 300k a month, right? Um, uh, so. Um, uh, and and then from 300k a month to you know three you know three million uh, a month, right? Um, so uh, basically, and you know they raised funding, etc. So how is it, and how is it that that the small companies, large companies, can all kind of benefit from having a growth framework, right? So this is the growth framework, all right? This is this is kind of this is just goofy, but uh, it's uh, uh, I borrowed the the original part of it right the r is dave mcclure's old pirate metrics if you guys are familiar with that dave mcclure is a guy who started 500 startups and he would evaluate companies based on a bunch of metrics right acquisition activation retention revenue referral you guys have all seen that okay what i realized was that um the research and the optimization piece were missing from that framework and it's actually the research that powers hypotheses and powers the optimization. And the optimization, there are two types of optimization. Optimizing for time, what to work on, and then optimizing on the tactic itself, okay? This is key. It sounds so banal, right? Banal, banal, but it is really the reason why I've been able to be part of teams and lead teams that have won over and over and over again in spaces where there's almost identical competitors, but who are better resourced. Okay, um, and this is my daughter uh, back when she was like uh, seven years old at the time, and she loved Lion King, and I couldn't come up with a better acronym, so I was like, okay, roar, roar. So, um, all right, here's here's one of the big lessons I've kind of learned in doing so many different uh, apps and marketplaces and e-commerce companies. Um, assuming product market fit, assuming you have product market fit, okay, um, which, by the way, doesn't assume you have product pricing fit or product offer fit perfectly. You might still be testing pricing. You might still be testing offers. But you have fundamentally, you, you're, you're providing something that people want, okay? Um, hyper growth, what I've seen hyper growth depend on is number one channel diversification. And especially these days, creative, uh, creative testing. Particularly these days, you guys all, all, all know how important creative testing and velocity is, right? Um, it also depends on ongoing, not once a month, once a year, twice a year, but ongoing quantitative and qualitative research to power your hypotheses. Okay, ongoing. It depends on using something like Roti or uh, Rotmi, <laughs> return on time investment, uh, to prioritize tests and initiatives each month and each quarter. Because you want to be lazy marketers. I'll say that again. You want to be lazy marketers. You don't want to be the hardest working marketer. You want to be the laziest marketer. Okay. Um, so what's the most amount of impact you can make with the least amount of effort is the question you should be asking yourself each time. Um, and then finally, you have to say no to most other things. This is probably the hardest thing. And I'll tell you guys some funny stories about how I had to keep saying no to uh, the head of Soothe's board. Um, who used to work for Steve Jobs, and he'd remind me of that every time. So he would say, at Apple, we did this thing. And I was like, that is so amazing. We're not Apple. We can't. We don't have those resources. We don't have the time. Um, and then finally, by saying no to most other things, you are able to have focused execution, and then you're going to be able to increase the velocity of your learning, right? The point of testing isn't to test. It's to learn, right? 
A lot of people think the point of testing is to win. Yes, you'd like to get wins. But what you're really doing with each test, whether you win or not, is you're learning. That's the key. Okay, now, so all things being equal, the company that runs more tests backed by both qual and quant data-driven hypotheses. This is the key. Don't You don't want to be running tests, right? And by the way, a test can mean I'm going to launch in a new channel, right? That's a test. Um, the company that runs more tests backed by both qual and quant data-driven hypotheses and says no to more things wins. The more things you say no to, the more you're going to win. Say no to your boss, to your founder, to your CEO, to your board. If you're not saying no once a month to the most important people in your company who you work for, if you're a founder, it's probably your investors, something's wrong. Either they don't care, so they're not throwing enough shit at you, or you're not a strong enough founder or head of growth or head of marketing or head of product that you're not able to say, no, that's not in our roadmap, that's not, it doesn't rank as high, it's not a good roti. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm only going to say one thing about channel di diversification. So in September 2018, Postmates was only in seven channels, and it was overly, overly dependent on Snap. I, I had to add the, like, the exclamation point question mark. And I was like, what the, like when I arrived, I was like, Hope, why? Why Snap? Um, so like our first six months of UA work, because um, I, was, I was working on uh, the, uh, overseeing UA and also overseeing um, you know, uh, testing and growth and then retention and life cycle. And then we also had like um, uh, GMs for our largest city. So those were kind of, that's what my portfolio there was. Um, so the first six months were just all about restructuring existing channels because there was no reason why uh, Snap should have been outperforming you know, things like Instagram and Facebook back then, right? Um, back then. Um, and so we went from 8 to 34 uh, user acquisition channels in 8 months. All right, uh, But that's the ones we adopted. That's the ones we actually kept. We actually tested more. Okay, um, And yes, there is, there are such a thing as 34 user acquisition channels. Um, some people who are earlier in the stage of their app, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm in Google. I'm in Meta. Like, okay, where is there a Snap? I mean, what else is there? There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a whole world. Okay, um, and then the other thing is we we that allowed us that plus the testing we were doing allowed us to scale our paid acquisition 10x. So we went from low millions per month to tens of millions per month without getting into too much detail. Although if you wanted to know what the number is, you could find it because you know Postmates you know filed to go public, so all of that's public um, uh, before it was acquired. Um, post Series B, or if you want to use a different proxy. Um, when you hit a certain amount of ad spend, right, and for different industries it's different, um, no channel should really account for over 30% of your user acquisition. Uh, post Series C, and again, or at a certain level of ad spend, no channel should account for more than 15 to 20%. I can tell you that when we were on the roadshow, when we were thinking we were going to go public, one of the biggest points I made to analysts, right, was, look at that, nothing accounts for more than 14%. No single one of the 34 channels accounted for more than 14% of ad spend. And there was only like one that was even that high. Okay. And that was a big deal because, of course, people were like, oh, well, what happens if this channel closes down or gets banned or whatever? So um, that's all I'm going to say about channels. But I'm now want to focus on the two parts of ROAR that are really, really important, research and optimization, and how they can make you outperform virtually any competitor. Okay. So... The most obvious thing is, look, okay, all things being equal, the company that uh, converts downloads, leads visitors into, into active customers at higher rates, and retains them wins, right? Okay, that's pretty obvious. Everybody here gets that. But what's less obvious is that the typical smart person, so smart person is a founder, a CEO, a product manager, an art director, an app designer, is right about 25% of the time of their hypothesis. I include myself uh, in, you know, in, in that group of smart but not so smart at hypothesis people. N no one, once, okay, once you've done obvious things like, hey, the CTA button doesn't work, okay, like you, so once you have like a funnel that sort of works, right, or a growth loop that kind of works, when you start having hypotheses, I guarantee you, you know, maybe someone here hits 28% right. That's about it, okay? Now, it's like Moneyball. How do you make sure Right. So, so imagine for a minute you only have enough traffic, you know, or, or users to run like four tests per month. And imagine if three out of the four you lose, 
doesn't that mean you're actually uh, destroying growth? Doesn't that, if three quarters of the time you lose or, or it's a tie, at best, you're going to break even. At best, probably you're going to actually uh, 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 destroy your growth. So what do you need to do? Well, what you need to do is you need to tip the scales by having a better hypothesis. And how do you have a better hypothesis? It's make sure that almost every test you run, like 9 out of 10, is backed by research. Okay? So, um, but no one wants to do research, right? We're going to get into how to do research quickly, super, like, stupid easily. And then uh, we're going to get into how that powers hypotheses. But no one wants to do research. Well, there's lots of really easy, quick and dirty ways you can do research. And I'm an advocate not of having just like a dedicated group of people that does nothing but research, although that's lovely. Um, I am an advocate of product managers and the design team um, and the growth team all being able to do their own re research, in, um, you know, in a jiffy, right? And I'm also an advocate of maybe sharing that responsibility. Take create a squad, call it the optimization squad in your company, right? By the way, if you are head of growth and you find yourself butting heads with product or you're head of product and you butt heads with growth or with marketing or any of those weird things, I see people smiling, um, do this. Create a optimization squad. Bring the best people from those groups and departments together, right? Even if it's someone that, that bugs you or competes for resources or engineering resources with you, whatever, bring them together, okay? And have them all help do the research. Then everybody wins, okay? Um, so start by, by figuring out where is the opportunity. So quant research, that, I don't need to advocate that here. I'm gonna skip this slide. I used to do this. I used to give people a quiz where I'd tell them like, here's, I know you guys are all app people like I am, but, but you know, this is just an easy way of talking about it. So I used to give people a quiz where I'd show folks, um, you know, hey, I've got a 1.48% conversion rate on, you know, desktop web, right? And I've got a 0.24% conversion rate on mobile. What if you, if I only give you like one weekend sprint, right? You've just got one weekend to boot out a test, right? Um, where would you test? And everybody would sit there and like, I'd say like two thirds of people used to tell me, oh my God, I do mobile. I would totally do mobile. Look, there's 105,000, you know, visits, you know, there's more traffic on mobile and it has such a low conversion rate. And the answer is wrong. That's wrong. No, because that's wishful thinking. Okay. Because if you have a uh, increase of 20%, right, on something that converts at 0.2, so you have a double digit increase, improvement at con in conversion rate of something that converts at 0.24%, you're only going to get yourself an extra 50 conversion sales. If you have a 20% increase on something that converts at 1.48%, you're going to get yourself 185 more sales per day. Okay? So, um, very, be very, very careful and re-examine what you're working on and what you're testing. Okay? All right. Now, there's four types of quick and dirty qualitative research for growth, which you can all be doing very, very fast. None of these take more than a week to boot out. Some of them take about an hour, okay? So number one is the five second test. Number two is moderated usability testing. Number three is polls, abandonment polls. And uh, number four is customer development, which is the one that takes a little bit longer, okay? Okay, what's the five second test? Five second test is participants are shown an app store uh, page a website, a pro, you know, an activation page in your app, and they're shown it for five seconds. And you literally, you just, like, you're counting. You're like, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. And then they're asked to describe what it is. So the questions you ask are, can you describe in your own words what this product or service is? Okay. By the way, this is key. When you recruit people, don't tell them what you're going to test them on. Also, don't qualify them that much. Qualify them by looking at them, by looking at their LinkedIn, by, by like, you know, figuring out who they are as much as you can. And if you don't know, you can ask qualifying questions at the end. The key thing is you don't want to sway the witness and you don't want to tell them what they're going to look at. The five second test, the whole point. So I don't want to like, if I came to you, you're in a co-working space, you're hanging out. I don't, I don't know. you. Uh, you're hanging out. And uh, this is my, my favorite method of recruiting people. I used to do this, by the way, it doesn't matter what your title is. You, you, you can and should recruit people. And if you're not comfortable approaching strangers, that's okay. Get someone on your team to do it. That's fine. Um, so I come to you at a co-working space. I'm like, hey, would you have like 10 minutes to look at this app I've been working on? Can you help me out? 
nine out of 10 people will be like, yeah, or yeah, I can't right now, but I'll do it later. Okay, co-working spaces are great places to recruit all kind, all flavors of humans, right? Um, and then, and they're like, and you're like, what's it about? And I'd be like, oh, um, I can't tell you, I just want to show it to you real quick. Do not let them know. Then you show them the thing for five seconds. Who do you think this product or service is for? That's your second question. What would you do next if you wanted to use product or service? That's it, those three questions. Now, the good news is you don't have to do this uh, standalone. You can add this as the first part of moderated user testing, okay? So here's 15, again, uh, sorry, I'm using a website example, but you, this is the same thing for an app, all right? This is 15.5, which by the way is a fantastic SaaS piece of software that helps you keep in touch with your team and uh, you know people who aren't like super vocal about how they're feeling or what they want things to look like or, or like reviews, um, this is a great way to, Check out 15.5. It's wonderful for your team. Uh, I'm not paid by them and don't work with them. Um, so um, this was their old. This was their old like landing page. Like know the pulse of your company. Discover ideas. Surface issues. Celebrate achievements. Tune into morale. I'm not really sure what it does. I don't know what it is. Okay. So we did like five second tests. Right. Um, this is like years ago. Um, and then the version B was improve team communication in 20 minutes per week. Sounds a lot better. And then it says below, 15.5 is a platform that helps you stay connected with your team, projects, and culture as your company grows. The grows part was very key, all right? Um, and then the how-to section, we have like short copy, short examples. So the result was an 88% conversion rate improvement, okay? That's what a five-second test, that's what moderated user testing can do for you, for your app, okay? Um, uh, just recently, uh, at Bridget, we had like a 12% improvement in activation rate from user, user interviews. 12%. This is a company that's over five years old, that's done a lot of testing, a lot of research. 12%. That, that's massive, right? Um, so, uh, moderated usability testing, which I encourage you to incur incorporate the five-second test in the beginning of all moderated usability, because then you get two for one. Um, so, you conduct it in person or remotely. Um, you ask participants to complete realistic tasks, um, and you just require a small number of participants. You only need four to six people, okay? I really encourage people to do two sets. Okay, if you want to be like moderate, one set of these per month, every month. And each month you pick a different group. New users, returning users, uh, users that use your full suite versus just one product. Users that 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 are paying but they haven't uh, uh, used the acti been active on the app for a while, things like that. But ideally, do it twice a month. Okay. Now, why is it that I can do it with only four to six people? How could four to six people give me something actionable? Well, when you summarize moderated user testing, it literally looks something like this: three out of four participants paused and frictioned at step seven of the booking flow. When asked what, uh, when asked um, if, uh, when asked a question about if anything um, uh, uh, was making them pause, because you have to ask open-ended questions. You can't be like, "Why were you confused?" Like you, you, you don't do that. You know, "Why did you hate my app?" No. Uh, you know, uh, when asked, uh, uh, two of the four referenced X Y Z copy. Okay. Um, so you only need four to six. By the way, this is classic usability. You, if you look up Jacob Nielsen, right? You look up uh, Schaefer. You look up uh, Norman Nielsen Lab. This this goes back. Everybody has proven that you can get all the low hanging fruit. 80, 90 percent of the things you're going to get, you can get by interviewing four to six people. And if three out of four people give you similar reasons for friction or doubt or not wanting to do something, you can action on it. Okay. Um, so. Customer development. I won't get into that because there's a guy named Steve Blank uh, in Silicon Valley who, um, you know, you guys can look up. It, it delivers incredibly boring lectures. is an incredibly, you know, brilliant guy. Um, and then, like, the whole lean startup movement kind of originated with Steve in some ways. You guys can look that up. Steve Blank uh, or Eric Reese and lean startup and a lot of customer development stuff. There's another guy named Tristan Cromer who's a buddy of mine. If any of you guys need like a guru of customer development and research, uh, another great guy, right? Really digging into like the why and the what are the alternatives to your product. <clears throat> this is the part that isn't so lightweight, okay? This is the part that like takes more. So how do you, how do you put all this together? So here's a protocol. This is 
a three-question protocol and a four-question post-task. So this is a u uh, this is usability five-second test and customer development all rolled up into one. Borrow it, steal it, you know. Um, so what is this website about and who's it for? Five-second test. Can, or what is this app about and who's it for? Can you please go ahead and register? Now then shut up and just let them do it, just because you're recording them, right? Then please go ahead and book a dog walk or book a massage or do your, you know, or, or pick a meditation if it's Headspace or whatever it is you're doing, right? Play your first game. Uh, buy your first artwork if it's Saatchi art, right? Doesn't matter. So, and again, just watch them. If they struggle at any point after they complete the screen, they are struggling. So let them struggle. It's going to be uncomfortable. A minute passes, two minutes, they can't get past the screen. They can't find the X to close out of the pop-up you're hitting them with. You know, your designer made the X really hard to find, okay? You have dark UX patterns, I know you. Um, so, um, you know, after they finish struggling, you know, if it's more than two minutes, then you can be like, okay, here's how you get out of this. But, but then you say, can you tell me what was happening for you? I noticed you paused. That's about as directive as you're going to get. So again, three questions, post-task questions. Did you have any questions after going through this process? Was there any information you were looking for that you could not find? What do you like most about this service? If you had a magic, this, this is my favorite one. If you had a magic wand, how would you improve WAG, Soothe, Headspace, Bridget, whatever? Okay, so there you go. Um, and this is my one of my favorite examples. Uh, this is the Netflix for Legos. 279%, uh, uh, they're out of business now, but 279% um, uh, <laughs> conversion rate increase in like 90 days. Uh, the funniest piece, the funniest part was that a 90% conversion rate improvement was when we added this first bullet. Lost a piece, no worries, we won't charge. Until we talked to eight moms and seven of them were like, I love this. I, this is a wonderful search. Because people would search in Google for like Legos and Lego sets and buying them. Then we'd just run some Google ads. We'd take them to the landing page about the Star Wars, right? Then they'd go all the way down the funnel. It was like the best performing thing I'd ever done, except at the final spot, uh, people were like not buying. And we didn't understand why. So, we, so I talked to Ranan, who was a, a former Israeli Air Force pilot and a former iBanker. So he was kind of a hard charging guy. Uh, and he was like, I paid you. You're a consultant. You don't, you don't know what you're doing. I'm like, I, have you ever sold something like this before? I don't know why they're, I don't know what their objection is, right? I have no idea. Do you know? And so we talked to eight moms and then seven out of eight were like, what if I lose a little piece? Are you going to charge me the whole set instead of me renting? Because that undercuts the whole value prop of the whole company, right? And so we added that. That was our first one. Our second one was this photo, this stupid stock image, right? Because it is. It, it actually won. This is the winner, because this mom is relatable. The kids look normal. The dad looks a little bit too Tommy Bahama with like the the the, the square jaw. But you know what it won over? It won over a beautiful video of a New York loft with like a model looking like mom and the perfect dad and their blonde, blue eyed, cherubic kids playing off of a floor with Legos. You could eat off this floor. The sunlight is streaming. Nobody could relate to these people. Nobody. And so the moms, during the seven out of eight interviews, one of the funny things we noticed was like th they would they would see the landing page, they'd talk about the, the Lego piece, and then they'd play the video, and then you could see the moms with bags under their eyes, with like normal human bodies like most of us have, right? You know, post having kids, post having a job, just the moms would just be like. <laughs> and then one mom was like, like, wow, her life is really perfect, isn't it? And so we were like, okay, I'm going to get rid of the beautiful video. So I, I talked to Renan, and I'm like, Renan, we got, we got to get rid of the video. Uh, it's just too perfect. You got to get rid of these models. He said, I'm sorry, this, the, the person in the video is my co-founder. <laughs> but we, we got rid of the video, and then we had the big win. Okay? All right, so uh, polls. This is one of my favorite things. Okay, so... Um, uh, what, if anything, is preventing you from buying a shake weight today? Don't buy a shake weight. But, um, <laughs> you, <laughs> okay, so you literally just have a poll like this in your app or on your website or both, and you say, what, if anything, is preventing you from buying with us today? Or from, up for Headspace, it was like from upgrading to a paid subscription, right? Ask that, and then you, you, you need, like, 
three to 600 responses, right? Okay, because you're trying to do a quant qual, right? You're trying to do a high quantity of qualitative responses. And then you put them together into a word salad, Pac-Man uh, 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 shape like this, right? Um, this one was from a, a shoe company, uh, right? Um, and, and then what you actually do is you create categories, right? So you, you can sit there and you can create something like this, and then you can create categories, and you can say, oh, um, and by the way, for like e-commerce or anything e-commerce-y, like about a third of people always say price, so don't think like your price is wrong just because a third of people said price, just as a tip. Um, okay, but abandonment polls, probably one of the best things, because you're asking people who are abandoning in the moment why they did. It's like the best thing in the world. Um, so combine uh, moderated user testing with a little bit of customer development snuck in at the end with abandonment polls, and that's probably your best tool for forming good hypotheses, right? Okay, um, so net-net, uh, net, do the research, prioritize forming good hypothesis, or just throw shit at the wall. Uh, can I say that? All right, now optimization. So most teams are working on too many right things at the wrong time, okay? Most, of the, most teams are. And it's very hard to say no to your boss, board member, head of product, or even to yourself and your own desire to do that. So um, this is borrowed from a great slide uh, uh, from Reforge, which is a great program, by the way. Um, Elena, uh, 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 Reforge and Elena Verna, who, who, who does this particular course, um, uh, didn't invent Roti, but they explain it really, really, really well uh, in that course. And so uh, Roti or Rotmi, uh, is return on time investment or return on time and money invested. I like to add in the money part. Um, but when you are scoring, right, what to work on, you want to look at what's the impact going to be, and you want to quantify that, okay? Um, you know, what's your confidence in like a 5 or 10% win? Most of the time, when you're doing something like a test, give yourself, make it simple. Rather than being like, I think it's going to be a 30% win, just pick 5% and pick 10 or 12, okay? Right, so pick something that's a single digit win and pick something that's like a low double digit win. You won't get in trouble that way. Um, and then you divide that by the effort, right? The, 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 the time. Um, uh, and then, uh, let's see. Um, optimize your time first, right? Uh, because again, there are dozens of things you can do. Uh, to give you a sense, like Soothe, when, when it was like started, um, it was, uh, we were doing uh, Google Ads, back then it was called Facebook, and PR. That was it. Those were the only like channels. And we were doing a, a boatload of like testing on the app and a boatload of retention and lifecycle stuff. And that was it. That's all it took to grow Soothe into like 30 cities, right? Um, now, that was a little bit earlier than now, but still, you, you, you know, you, you, what you want to do is you really want to focus your efforts as much as possible. Um, and a uh, couple pro tips. Before you start testing, make sure, like, you've got the people. So you need your own designers, right? Um, if uh, this is something, I'm going to get to a, a growth killer slide in a second uh, to wrap up. But um, uh, if design is a separate department you're going to, and you have to like borrow, or you have to like marketing, God forbid, has to submit proposed things to design and design approves, you're going to kill your pace of innovation and testing, right? Um, make sure that people uh, all agree on the principles. How long do you test? What's a winner? Who decides? Like that's really clear and in writing. Uh, make sure your QA is good because th there's like a last mile problem in tests. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, lastly, like make sure your tools, your attribution is there. Um, and here's, here's my list of five surefire ways to fail at growth, uh, to wrap up. So one is fetishizing visual design over user experience. As you can tell from the slide deck, I am not fetishizing visual design. Okay. Um, uh, uh, number two, uh, don't do any qualitative research. Do not ask people why or why not. Just look at your funnel, see where the friction is, and then be like, I'm a smart guy, I think I can just you know, run a test and see what, let's see what happens. No more than 10 to 20% of your tests, like one to two out of 10 should be what if tests. Like I realize sometimes you can't avoid it because you really don't know, right? But it's a big thing, it's a big what if. So uh, sometimes things like pricing, right? Or anchoring two prices, like you, it's really a what if, right? Fine. But 
eight out of 10 should be with a strong hypothesis. Um, uh, don't call your tests early, all right? So um, uh, FTD, uh, I'll just get, this is uh, very open. Uh, so FTD Pro Flowers um, was doing, what uh, was taken out of bankruptcy, right? By like a private equity firm. And uh, they hired McKinsey uh, uh, to do their CRO, their A-B testing. Um, uh, so uh, McKinsey was, was telling them to call tests at uh, like one to 2% wins at 80% confidence. Okay, eighty percent confidence. Yeah, I see. I see one person laughing. I see. Okay, so eighty percent confidence is like you're more or less halfway between fifty-fifty. I don't know, and a hundred percent. I'm confident this is a win. Meaning you, you've got no clue. And one to two percent is within the margin of error for most things, like political polls. So that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And so you know, we we fired McKinsey, but um, um, uh, very quickly after I, I I got there to help out. So um, you know, really, uh, the the lower your wins, right, uh, the more confidence. Confident. So call tests at 95%, 98 point. Okay, if something wins by like 50%, you can call it at 95%. But don't call things at 90% even. Like don't do that. Just 95, 98, 98.5, 99, fine, right? Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, another, another thing I would say is like um, uh, don't test one single change to your funnel or to your pages or anything at a time. Okay, when you start, when you start. So you did research and you have a hypothesis that uh, these three or four things are going to improve stuff, right, on your activation page in your app to get people to register. Test them all at once. I know that goes against how we as analytical thinkers like, oh, well, I made this bigger and I added one line. Sure, but you're gonna be here all day. Remember, time is your most precious asset. So you have a strong hypothesis when you first start testing a page or a funnel or a growth loop, throw all the things at it and then narrow, narrow, narrow. And as you narrow, you'll learn a lot more which thing it was, right? Okay. Um, I think that's it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of done with these. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Um, so the question was, um, uh, you know, uh, w if it takes you a certain amount of time to get to stat sig and you're not reaching stat sig and it's been two weeks, three weeks, four. So um, if if things are just really like close to a tie or or it's uh, indeterminate, right? You typically say indeterminate and you stay with the incumbent, right? Because the incumbent has been tested, it's been working. So you default to the incumbent most of the time unless you have a clear win. Um, and okay, rules of thumb are if you've got 1,500 of something and 1,500 of something on each side, you, you've got a test per day, right? In terms of traffic, you've got a testable platform, right? Um, unless you're, you're, you think you're going to get like 30% wins, if you have less than 1,500 or 3,000 per day, 2, 000, two to 3,000 per day in terms of traffic, uh, it's gonna be very hard for you to do like serious testing. Um, test things for at least one, ideally two weeks, right? Unless you're in a world where you're like booking.com and you can t test shit for like one day, right? Because you have so much traffic. But even booking.com makes exceptions and then it'll run things for a much longer time uh, if they need uh, the day parting data, right? Okay, to recap, you have an app, uh, it's, uh, the choice is uh, you can pay 15 bucks for a whole year, or you can pay $5 annual. Per month. Oh, sorry, sorry, $5 per month, right? And you're asking which, which would you be testing? You'd be, which would you be testing? The, you'd work on... Well, it seems like it would take over a year to get the results, because you don't know how many people are gonna stay on for more than three months if they do the monthly. And then how many people will stay on being renewed um, for the after the year? I see. Uh, okay. So what I would probably do there is simply look at um, you know you have to run this test for you know probably three months, right? So that you can see like where you like you would break even. But um, I would, and this is beyond the scope of this conversation. But like I would look at how you chose fifteen and five. Um, uh, Pricing is an amazing thing to work on. It's one of the biggest levers. And I really encourage growth people to not think of pricing as something the CFO deals with or pricing consultants only. I, I've partnered with a number of different pricing consultancies because they have like 
just the bandwidth to run pricing research. Um, but we've also run like in-house at Bridget. We've run our own pricing research. We've hired some pricing consultants as well. Um, I think growth and product people should be really involved in pricing. 